In addition to the assembly of wood structural elements to form a structural system, wood framing also involves cutting, notching, and drilling lumber elements to facilitate proper connections and to accommodate other building systems. Notches are commonly used in diverse structural applications including the notching of posts to create a bearing surface for beams, notching ledgers to accommodate the supported joists, notching studs to accommodate ledgers and notching deep beams or joists at supports to maintain floor or roof elevations. At the same time, holes and notches are often necessary to run mechanical, electrical, and plumbing distribution systems through floors and walls. While these modifications are essential, they also affect the strength of the lumber. Every notch, cut, or hole removes material, reducing the wood's ability to carry loads. If done incorrectly, these alterations can lead to excessive deflection, bouncy floors, sagging ceilings, or even structural failure in extreme cases. That is why the International Residential Code provides strict guidelines on where and how lumber can be cut or drilled. Section R 502.8 lays out the rules for floor joists while Section R 602.6 applies to wall studs and plates. Additionally, the provisions on notching of structural roof members are provided in Section R 802.7. These provisions ensure that framing modifications maintain structural integrity while allowing necessary adjustments for construction and building services. Ignoring or misunderstanding these code requirements can have serious consequences. Let us consider the following examples. A plumber cuts a deep notch in a floor joist near the mid-span to fit a drain pipe. While the modification allows the plumbing to pass through, it severely reduces the joist's bending strength. Over time, the floor begins to sag, leading to uneven surfaces and drywall cracking in the rooms below. Eventually, the deflection becomes so severe that the floor needs expensive reinforcement or replacement. In another case, an electrician drills multiple large holes close to the edge of the studs at the mid-height level to run electrical conduit. The excessive removal of material weakens the studs, reducing their ability to resist out-of-plane wind forces. During a high wind event, the wall flexes more than it should, causing drywall cracks. In a worst-case scenario, the weakened studs fail during a hurricane, leading to costly repairs or even structural collapse. In yet another case, a builder notches the top plates along an exterior braced wall line to accommodate pipes running vertically through the wall but fails to reinforce the affected areas. This will result in a significant reduction in the wall's ability to distribute lateral loads from the roof and floor loads to the wall bracing or shear walls, leading to failure in the lateral system in a high wind or seismic event. Many of these mistakes can be prevented if code-compliant notching, boring and cutting requirements are clearly specified on the drawings and if builders adhere to the requirements laid out on the drawings. The plans should clearly specify the limitations and guidelines on notching, boring holes and cutting and must ensure that such requirements are consistent with code limits. For cases where code limits must be exceeded, a licensed engineer must provide calculations and details to justify an alternative approach according to local code requirements. In this video, we will provide a breakdown of the International Residential Code requirements on notches, cuts and holes in sawn lumber framing members. By understanding these guidelines, builders, contractors, engineers, and designers can ensure their projects remain safe, structurally sound, and code compliant. Let us begin with Section R 502.8 which covers the prescriptive guidelines on notches, holes and cuts on floor framing members. These requirements also apply to roof framing members as specified in Section R 802.7 as we shall see later. As we have said, notches, cuts and holes will typically undermine the structural integrity of wood framing members. Therefore, the limitations and guidelines provided in the International Residential Code on notches, cuts and holes are intended to ensure that the negative effects resulting from these actions are as minimal as possible. This is achieved by limiting the size of the notches and holes. This is also achieved by limiting them to specific locations or regions along the structural members while prohibiting them at other locations. 
Other measures include limiting the proximity of holes and notches to each other or the proximity of holes to the edges. When it comes to the notching requirements, the IRC first distinguishes between members that are less than 4 inches thick and those that are nominal 4 inches thick or more. Since joists and rafters are typically 2 by members, they will fall under members that are less than 4 inches thick. On the other hand, headers and beams are typically nominal 4 inches thick or more and therefore these will fall under the category of members that are 4 inches thick or more in nominal dimensions. Let us start with members that are less than 4 inches thick in nominal dimensions. The IRC does not permit any notches in the middle one-third of sawn lumber members that are less than 4 inches in nominal thickness. This is because for uniformly loaded members as is typical with residential framing, maximum bending moments occur at the mid-span of floor joists and decreases gradually to zero at the supports. By prohibiting notching in the middle one-third of the joist, the IRC ensures that joists will not be notched at locations experiencing the highest stress demands. While joists and rafters in conventional construction are typically 2 inches thick, beams are typically 4 inches or more in thickness. It is expected that members that are 4 inches or more in thickness are likely to be supporting higher uniform loads than members that are 2 inches in thickness. For members that are 4 inches or more in nominal thickness, the code does not permit notching on the tension side except at the supports. What does it mean when the code says that notching is not permitted on the tension side? What is the tension side? When a framing member such as a joist or beam supports load along its span, the cross-section is subjected to longitudinal internal forces or normal stresses along the axis of the beam. For vertical loads acting downwards, the upper part of the beam or joist is subjected to compressive stresses while the lower part is subjected to tensile stresses. For vertical loads acting upwards such as wind uplift forces, the upper part of the beam or joist is subjected to tensile stresses while the lower part is subjected to compressive stresses. For roof framing members that are likely to experience wind uplift and therefore end up with net upward bending, the tension side will be the top part of the beam under net uplift or the bottom of the beam under vertical gravity loads. For floor members that are supported on two supports at the end such as joists, headers and beams, the tension side is the bottom part of the beam. For cantilever members supporting floor loads, the upper part is the tension side. Therefore, for members that are less than 4 inches in nominal thickness, notches are permitted outside of the middle one-third of the members while for members equal to or more than 4 inches in nominal thickness, notching is permitted at the supports. For locations where notches are permitted, Section R502.8.1 also specifies that the depth of notches should be limited to one-sixth of the member's actual depth while the width should be limited to one-third of the member depth. The same section also specifies that members may be notched up to one-quarter of the member depth at the supports. The limitations or guidelines on holes are also provided in Section R502.8.1. First, the size of the hole should not exceed a third of the beam or joist depth. Additionally, the distance between the edge of the hole to the top or bottom surface of the member should not be less than 2 inches. The same section also specifies that holes should not be closer than 2 inches to any other hole or closer than 2 inches to notches on the same member. Let us now look at the limitations and guidelines on notches and holes at bearing walls. In addition to supporting load, wall studs may also be required to accommodate the installation of both electrical and mechanical distribution systems. This is accomplished by notching and boring holes through the studs to facilitate the passage of pipes and conduits. The requirements for drilling holes and notching of wall studs are provided in Section R602.6 of the Residential Code. For exterior walls and bearing walls the limitations are as follows. First, the hole diameter must not exceed 40% of the stud depth unless the stud is doubled. If double studs are used, the hole diameter shall not exceed 60% of the stud depth. Secondly, as mentioned, 
If the hole diameter is between 40% and 60% of the stud depth, then the studs must be doubled. However, no more than two double studs are allowed to be bored with the diameter of the hole exceeding 40% of the stud depth. Thirdly, the distance from the edge of a hole to the edge of the stud should not be less than 5 eighths of an inch. Fourthly, board holes shall not be located in the same cross section with a cut or a notch in the stud. And finally, notches on studs must not exceed 25% of the stud depth. These requirements apply to bearing partitions or exterior walls. We will discuss the limitations for notches at interior non-bearing partition walls shortly. The code provides an exception where approved stud shoes are used. Stud shoes may be proprietary products with approved code evaluation reports. Examples of proprietary stud shoes include the Simpson SS and HSS stud shoes which are covered in the ICC Code Evaluation Report No. 2608. Section 2.1 of the report issued in January 2025 and subject to renewal on January 2026 states that when the size of the hole, notch or cut exceeds the maximum specified in the code, these stud shoes may be used provided an engineered design is submitted. These means that any unlicensed designer using these stud shoes where code maximums have been exceeded must consult a qualified engineer or licensed professional as required by local laws to provide an engineered design. The installation of the stud shoes must conform to the requirements in the code evaluation report. In addition to proprietary stud shoes, other strengthening alternatives that are designed according to accepted engineering standards may be used. In this case, many jurisdictions require the construction details and calculations by a licensed engineer or architect be submitted for review and approval prior to construction. Interior partition walls are non-load-bearing walls intended to create partitions or rooms. The requirements for the construction of interior partition walls are specified in Section R602.5. Partition walls should have minimum 2 by 3 studs at 24 inches on center and at least a single top plate. The code also allows flat studs spaced at 16 inches on center for partition walls that are not used as braced walls. Just like bearing walls, notching and drilling requirements for partition walls are also provided in Section R602.6. For non-bearing partitions, the maximum limit for drilled holes is 60% of the depth of the stud. The studs do not need to be doubled if the drilled holes exceed 40% of the depth of the stud as is the case with bearing walls. Just like we noted for bearing walls, the distance from the edge of a hole to the edge of the non-bearing stud should not be less than 5 eighths of an inch. Additionally, bored holes shall not be located in the same cross-section with a cut or a notch in the stud. Finally, for non-bearing partitions, notches are limited to a maximum depth that is equal to 40% of the depth of the stud. Just like wall studs, the top plates at exterior walls or interior bearing walls may need to be notched or drilled to accommodate pipes and ducts. Top plates span between studs and provide gravity support to rafters or joists above. Top plates also support the wall studs against lateral out-of-plane loads. Additionally, top plates act as continuous collectors to distribute in-plane lateral loads to the braced walls. Therefore, Notches or holes in the top plate will reduce the capacity of the top plates and may undermine its ability to support loads. To ensure that the top plate remains capable of supporting loads, the code provides prescriptive limits and measures intended to safeguard against structural failure resulting from notching or boring holes at the top plates. According to Section R602.6.1 of the IRC, if the notches or drilled holes exceed 50% of the plate width, a tie is required to compensate for the reduced capacity. The code requires a 16-gauge by 1.5-inch wide galvanized metal tie with 8 10-penny nails on each side of the notch or cut. The nails must have a minimum length of 1.5 inches and the metal tie must extend at least 6 inches on each side. 
According to the exception in section R602.6.1, the metal tie plates are not required for cases where the entire wall on the side with the notch is sheathed with wood structural panel sheathing. It appears that the code considers that the wood structural panels will provide the required reinforcement. The contractor must ensure that the wood structural panels are properly nailed to the top plates as required. In conclusion, we can see that the implementation of the requirements in the International Residential Code on notching and holes in structural framing members is not about avoiding a failed inspection. Rather, this is about building homes that are safe and can support the well-being of the occupants. If you wish to learn more about the structural design of residential buildings, check out the Residential Wood Framing Design Series at www.conventionalframing.com. This step-by-step -step program takes you through the process of designing and developing the drawings of a two-story home using the prescriptive provisions of the International Residential Code. You will learn how to design and document an entire structure from the roof, the floors and decks, walls and foundations as well as wall bracing while ensuring full compliance with the International Residential Code. If you're a contractor looking to streamline your workflow, a designer wanting to master residential wood framing, or a design enthusiast planning your own project, this course is for you. Nearly all states permit all individuals to design one- and two-family wood-framed buildings using the conventional framing provisions in the International Residential Code even if they are not licensed as structural engineers or architects. Click the link in the description to learn more and start designing with confidence. Thanks for watching, and if you found this video helpful, be sure to like, subscribe, and stay tuned for more insights into wood framing.